uh, to be up here. In fact, I was here on Friday, and you didn't know it. And I was here on Monday, and you didn't know it. Uh, I drove through town with my camper on the way to Owen Sound, and I do everything I can to avoid the 407 and avoid the 410. So, um, because you know, you, when you're driving something like that behind you, it's easy to kind of find yourself swaying in the wind when these transports uh, either drive beside you or come down the road at you. And um, so I always try to maneuver my way through this way to get over towards Shelburne, right? Otherwise, I have to go up through Horseshoe Valley. And those hills are big. They're really, really big. And uh, it's nothing like going 120 down one hill only to go up 40 up another hill. And uh, so it's, it's nice to come through Alliston, right? And uh, so I appreciate, always appreciate the uh, town. I also appreciate the OPP always kind of, you know, graciously, you know, moving you on. And that's great. There is a wonderful presence. I always talk about the presence of God, but there's a wonderful presence of the OPP in this town, isn't there? Yeah, they're just what, behind us, I think, over here. So anyways, it's good to see you. Glad to be here. Sorry why Cindy couldn't make it this morning. She was not well yesterday afternoon and um, bowed out at that time. And that always happens when we've been with um, our younger grandchildren for any period of time. We seem to kind of just be... Uh, magnets for every germ that's that's coming along and um uh so we we're, we're okay no we're, we're doing fine today at least i am she's still at home i think in bed but we're here uh this morning uh i've been asked and gladly um received it whether i would just uh, give uh, a chat about the holy spirit and um I love talking about the Holy Spirit, to be honest with you. I, I, he and I have this wonderful uh, rapport and me talking about him uh, because I know he talks to the Father about me. Um, so I feel that equally I have to have share, you know, time for me to talk to, about him to you. And, uh, uh, and all I have to do is say good things about him to you, right? Um, whereas he's probably saying some things about me that, are, you know, Father, you need to work on this. You need to work on that. But I only have good things to talk about when it comes to him. And <clears throat> the Holy Spirit is funny because I never grew up in a gathering of people who talked about him. I, it just didn't exist. In fact, uh, uh, when he, his name did come up and people said, you know, Holy Spirit, I thought, ooh. And we kind of treated him like the strange uncle. You know, the uncle that walks in and you haven't seen for maybe 15 years and all of a sudden you realize why you haven't seen him for 15 years. You're looking at him. He has that awkwardness about him. He's that elephant in the middle of the room and everybody's kind of dancing around him. Think, how do we how do we get through this conversation? Right. And he's doing the weird things that everybody feels weirded about. And, and, and when you get in the, the vehicle to go home and you think, whew, just glad to kind of not feel that sense of strangeness about you going through the whole, the, the whole conversation that you just had. So the Holy Spirit is, is, has been a bit like that. I remember when we would mention him and, and all of a sudden it would just produce these, these ideas and thoughts in my head that were like way out there, like just weird things going on and, and because that's how I knew him and then I was also told to be careful about him and also kind of just you know uh, just calm him down in in my in my thinking and so I have never really had a healthy understanding of him uh, I just didn't have it and uh, I I was a bit surprised one day when all of a sudden he baptized me by with his presence and I didn't ask for him to do that he just did, and he showed up in my life and was more or less this intruder. And I found now that I was being invaded by this, this person that, that walks with God, and I didn't know a whole lot about him. And I, I had to learn about him, had to grow to understand him. And it was, has been an experience of a lifetime, to be honest with you, because I have found myself in places where, uh, like I said, I've been zero on the Holy Spirit to 100% in the things of the Spirit, and all of a sudden freaking myself out. 
You know, that's pretty bad, isn't it? And trying to find out what, who is he? What's he all about? What's he mean to me? What's he mean to my life? What's he mean to this world? Because sometimes, you know, we in the Christian circles, we talk about things that have little, 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 little relevance outside of our meetings. And I want you to understand that the Holy Spirit, he is relevant to when you're alone. He's relevant to when you are with people. He's relevant to when you're with people from work, when you're with your uh, family and you're with relatives and he's with, in your neighborhood. He is relevant to all these things. And unfortunately, in Christian circles, sometimes we just keep him in our little huddle. And we, we enjoy him in the huddle and we celebrate him in the huddle to a certain degree, to whatever degree that might be but we don't necessarily know about him in our world. And I wanted to know the Holy Spirit in the context that God wanted us to see him. I don't want to know the Holy Spirit in a religious way. Do you hear what I'm saying? And I want to say it in a charismatic religious way. I also want to say it in an evangelical religious way. I want to say it also in a Christian religious way. So we cover all of our bases. I just, I wanted them to know him in the context of how God wants us to know him. And that is different than the ones I just said. Because we're all coming from a place of bias. We're all coming from a place of certain prejudice in us. And so we somehow look at him through those glasses, through those eyes, and we will relegate him. We will put him off to a certain place or somehow introduce him to situations because of our understanding of him. But I wanted to know him as God understood him. But I also wanted to know him how God, as, as how God has sent him to us, to me, to you. I wanted to know him in that way. And so, like I said, he surprised me. He came up, he snuck up on me. I was 16 years old, a little bit naive, uh, and in a very strange and awkward meeting, and all of a sudden, he said, okay, we're going this way. And found out that he and I were partnered then for the rest of our life, working things out. And that's, that's been my experience with him. I did, like I said, I had no no one ever talked to me about him. I had no one ever say this is what's going to happen. No one ever say what's going to take place. So all my experiences with the Holy Spirit was basically him initiated. Not me trying to contrive something, but me just simply being open to what God was having. So with all that background, let's look at a few scriptures here this morning, because I think it gives us helpful context to what we're talking about here today. So I'm gonna be reading off my phone, so forgive me for putting my glasses on. I can see you clearly, but it's the words that go fuzzy, right? So, <clears throat> so let's work with that. I'm gonna stick this Kev somewhere in here. Is this okay? Yeah? Hmm. You, you stick it in there and I'll... See, it's that easy, isn't it? Okay, so if you have your Bibles, let's turn to Acts chapter 19. And I want to read to you this morning out of this because I feel it's very helpful to put Scripture into the context of what we're talking about. It's Acts chapter 19. And if you have a question, if you have uh, an aha moment, don't be afraid to say, whoa, wow. Go, go ahead. Because sometimes when I say those kind of things, it just sinks deeper. It does, seriously. It just all of a sudden sinks deeper for me. If you have a question of where I'm going with this, ask it. We'll see if we can go after it, okay? So that's what we're here for today. We're here to really get a hold of this person that, that uh, Jesus has sent us. So in Acts chapter 19, we come to this, this, this verse, and it says, While Apollos, verse 1, was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived, arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples. 
and ask them. Now, these are dis different disciples than the disciples that Jesus walked with, okay? So please understand that. The, the, the disciples grew. Everyone who followed Jesus was a disciple. So that's why we're in this place where there are some disciples in Ephesus. There he found some disciples, and he asked them, verse 2, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Now, he wasn't asking a theological question. He was asking them an experiential question question. Have you experienced the Holy Spirit since you believed? Right? He's not asking them a, theology, uh, a question about theology. He was asking them about where they're at spiritually in their own experience. So then they said, they answered, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Now, if I probably ask some people in Christian circles today, did they receive the Holy Spirit? Some would say, sorry, don't really know a lot about him. And in fact, if you, we did a survey today, you would hear and you would find out that within most Christian circles, almost 90% of the people that are claiming to be born again people do not know the Holy Spirit. So we are here in Acts chapter 19. This is relevant to us today. So we come to this place in verse 3. So Paul asked them, then what baptism did you receive? Now he's talking about a baptism and the Holy Spirit. Now that takes us into whole different circles. Right? Because we know what baptism in water is. But have we heard about a baptism with the Holy Spirit? He's reaching for this. He's reaching for an experience. Have you heard about the Holy Spirit? Have you heard about what he does? Have you known him? And then he's saying, have you received a baptism with the Holy Spirit? That is the context of Acts chapter 19. He's reaching into the church and saying, where are you at? with the Holy Spirit. And where are you at in particular, not just about knowing about the Holy Spirit, where are you in particular about a baptism with the Holy Spirit? Do you follow me? Okay, so we get a little bit further. John's baptist, that baptism, they replied. Verse 4, Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them. Amazing. And they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. Now, this is a, a, a phenomenal thing that takes place. He begins to talk to them about about the Holy Spirit and talk to them about, about the difference of where they're at spiritually and what Jesus has intended for them. And in his explanation upon that, they say, okay, John's baptism is okay, but we need to press further. Now, hear me, folks. Here is a group of Christians saying there's more. Yes. A group of Christians saying what we have is okay. But there's more intended for us. And based upon that, they're moving in faith towards it. I want to say this to you. We need Christian people to be a people who understand that God has more. And a group of people who are willing to move towards it. We do not need reluctant Christians. We do not need hesitant Christians. We need Christians who, based upon hearing the word of God, say, my experience with God is good, but can be greater. And by faith, reach for it. Isn't that awesome? By faith, reach for it. They say, okay, this is outside our wheelhouse. What, how, what's my reaction going to be? I'm going to a different church. You hear what I'm saying? What's my reaction to it? Well, maybe I'll just stop coming and come every other Sunday instead. Or maybe I'll just shut down this whole conversation and draw out my own little faith and my own little doctrine. No, they're saying, okay, we're hearing things we've not heard before. 
or hearing what God wants for us. And based upon that, we're going to reach for it. <laughs> I'm preaching to, I know, all of us here and even to myself right now. There are things that God wants to do in the world. And the reason why they're not happening is because many of us have settled with what we have, not realizing that God has intended far more than where we're at right now. And as a church, as the church, hear me, as the church, God's people, his house, a representation of him in the earth, doesn't somehow connect with us that we need to be moving towards all that he has. Oh, wow. So based upon that, they hear something, and in hearing it, and hearing what they're talking about, they're baptized in water, and then they're open to this new thing that they've not heard about before. It's new to them. It's fresh water. And the disciples go out amongst them. And just by touching them with their hands, people begin to see the Holy Spirit just like that. Was it something contrived? No. It's something they wanted. Was this something forced upon them? No, something they were desiring. God did something. I've learned in my experience because of things that we're talking about here, that the Holy Spirit is actually a person who we have been meant to have in our lives since the beginning of time. It's not as if he's all of a sudden been thrown into the mix because Jesus has left. Now, we all kind of get that idea, and rightly so, by reading in John what the Holy Spirit is and where he's coming from. John 14, John 15, John 16, Jesus is talking about it. And in talking about him, he's urging us to somehow know that he is sending a gift to us. Do you hear that? A gift. One person once said to me, well, if he's a gift, then don't I have a right to receive him? I mean, to not receive it, to not receive him. And I thought, man, I don't think so. I don't think so. Jesus is talking about this gift, and it sounds as if it's something that really is totally different to what the world has known, not as, as known. And that's true at that time. But the Holy Spirit is not strange to the world, and not strange to God's doings, and not strange to what's happening in the world that we live in. Now, if you want to look with me, if you just look at Genesis chapter 1. And if we go there, and um, <clears throat> the interesting thing about this we get a glimpse of the Holy Spirit, and really we get a glimpse of him in the context of how he works with God. And not only how he works with God, but what he really likes to do. And you'll see that that has such a parallel to Jesus sending us the Holy Spirit, as he talks about in John 14, 15, and 16. Now, if you look at Genesis chapter 1, how many have read this part of the Bible before? Right? This is the thing that we're all talking about. We're all taught the creation story over and over and over again to the point that it's more about creation than it is about God's intention. You with me there? It's more about creation. God made this, God made that. And we're all talking about how important we all realize that God made it. Well, I want you to know what was his intention in making it. Because in doing so, we understand why we're here. I'm sorry, I'm one of those little kids that are around three years old. I've got a granddaughter who's three right now, going on three right now. My goodness, if I just could stop the question, why? You need to stop that right now. Why? Because I said so. Why? Because it's important that you don't do that. Why? I thought, Come on, let's just stop this cycle, right? But that's how she's learning. She's learning because she's asking why. We learn by asking why. And I want to ask God, why? Why did you make this world in the way that you did? I just don't want to believe that he made the world, but I know why he made the world. And asking the question why, I understand why I'm here. Why do am I a part of this thing? Why am I part of this group of people? Why am I a part of what God wants to say, putting his Holy Spirit in me? What's your intention in all this? Genesis 1 helps us understand the why. Because if you look in Genesis 1, it says this. 
Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Now, hear this. This world was resting in darkness. Darkness is representative of chaos. How many of you have been walking in the dark? I was out in the campground just recently. And you know it's darker in the woods sometimes than anywhere else in the world, right? And I'm no, I just I'm out there and I'm kind of blindly walking around and thinking, how do I? I, I should have brought a flashlight or something like that. And I know I'm I take this road to the left and I'm not quite sure. And then I have to bring out my phone. Oh yeah, God, I've, I've got a flashlight on this, right? That it opens up my world. But it was chaotic until that point in time, to which my wife even makes it more difficult because she's the one that's saying, where are we going? I'm saying, trust me, right? <laughs> trust me, we'll get there. I, I think I know this way. There is this thing within darkness that it brings chaos to our life. It brings this thing of where we find ourselves blind in situations. And, and it produces fear, it produces doubt, it produces all these types of things. A lot of us like to think of the big sins. But to be honest with you, it's the chaos. It's the danger. It's the meaningless. It's without purpose that echoes loud within my mind. And this is what this is existing. The world was filled with darkness, had no purpose. The world was filled with darkness, had no sense of destiny. The world was filled with darkness. It, had, it was chaotic and everything. It wasn't serving any point. You with me? Now, hovering does not mean hanging out. What are you doing? Hovering. It doesn't mean that you're just kind of out there, kind of suspended in the middle of nowhere. Hovering is actually used as the word waiting. The Holy Spirit is hovering over darkness. Now, the Holy Spirit is in between something right now at this point. He's in between darkness and light. And he's existing in this place where he's waiting. What's he waiting on? He's just hovering on, just, no, he's doing nothing, just hanging. No, he's not. He's existing in this state between two real entities, darkness and light. And he's waiting. Waiting. Next verse tells us, and God said, the word, the word is spoken. The Holy Spirit says, now it's my time. And he interprets the intentions of God and produces light, earth, water, and he brings shape to emptiness. Isn't that incredible? Hovering, waiting over emptiness without shape, without purpose. He's come from shape, purpose, all those things that matter in the world. He's come for the, and he's waiting for God to speak. And with the word says, let there be. Holy Spirit kicks it into action. And immediately Holy Spirit begins to produce God's intentions in the earth. Right down to the very point of you. Right down to the very point where you are shaped from the dust of the earth, from something that just was just made by the hands of God, and then the Holy Spirit creates this being alongside of God, and this breath is breathed into you. Whoa. Whoa. Isn't it interesting that Jesus is described as the Word? And that he comes to earth as the word. And as the word, 
he is also the light. <laughs> and who does Jesus say to us in John chapter 16 and promise us? He says, I'm going to promise you the Holy Spirit. And what's he say about the Holy Spirit? He'll shed the light on things. He'll open up things. He'll help you understand. He'll help you to see. I think about these things. I think of them in the context as how we've known the Holy Spirit. Meetings where there's a lot of things happening. Some things we understand. Sometimes we don't understand it. And we walk away. And for the most part, people remain the same. And we see Christians who are sad. We see Christians who find themselves walking in defeat. We find Christians who are finding themselves in a place without faith, without a sense of purpose, without a sense of destiny, not knowing their real identity. And we think of this person, of the Holy Spirit, they don't know him. And he's hovering over you, waiting to pour himself up over your life so that he might infuse into you and shape you into the very intentions that God has meant for you. Do you understand why the disciples were walking amongst the church that day and say, do you know the Holy Spirit? Being the church was not good enough. Being the church baptized in the Holy Spirit, who then would be shaped out of their emptiness into the fullness of God. You with me here? Who would then be shaped out of their emptiness and be shaped into their fullness of Christ by the Holy Spirit. That was what he was looking for. That's what the disciples are looking for. That's why it's important to them. That's why they're asking the question, have you known, do you know this Holy Spirit? They say we've never heard of him. Man, well, they didn't kind of walk away and say, well, we're of the church of the Holy Spirit. See you later. They said, we got to fix this. We can't let this continue. Do you hear the intention in their voices? Have you heard? No. Well, then we're going to tell you. They were not willing to leave that. We're not willing to sit, let that just hang out and let it just be there. They said, no, this is what God is looking for. Jesus, just give us greater intention today. Give us a, a greater sense of what's important to you right now. Rather than somehow just be willing to pass it off and let it go. They were not willing to let it go. In Acts chapter 19, you see disciples who are after Christ, who want to see something happen, to want to, to the point where they want to see his people filled, baptized in the Holy Spirit, and seeing their lives transformed daily. Daily. Why? Because this person, the Holy Spirit, is never done with the Word of God. He's never done with what God wants to do. Never done to the point where, okay, well, we're going to leave Steve alone. No, <laughs> they, they say, man, he's going to be so much like Jesus by the time we're done. That's what the Holy Spirit says to him. Says it to God every day. Don't worry about him. I got him. I got Steve. I've got him. I'm working on him. He's moving. It's great. But there's been times when I know that he's going, oh, God, help us. I just got, I don't know what he's doing. But his job is to produce the fullness of God in me. And what does that look like? Well, it's the very thing that we're trying to force into our children to beat them with. Be kind. Love your brother. Love your mother. Right? Have some patience for crying out loud. Do you know that the fruit of having this spirit in me is patience, is kindness, is love. If you don't see the love and the kindness and the patience in me, then you have to question whether you see the Holy Spirit in me. 
Come on. Because it is the fruit of the Spirit. In other words, the fruit is something that comes because something already exists. Something already exists. I remember one day trying to teach one of our kids about not lying. And I thought, man, if I could just shake it into him. I don't think that's what the, how he gets that. Meanwhile, I probably should have been talking to him more about what it is to follow after the Lord, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. And when you feel you can't do it, the Holy Spirit's there, and he's there to help you. So we see in Acts chapter 19 that the disciples are really concerned. Paul's really concerned. They're all really concerned that somehow the church manifests this Holy Spirit in ways that they've not known him before. And we find that where we in John 1, John 14, John 15. We read the, let me just read to you John 15. But when the spirit of truth comes, he is the one who will guide you into all truth. He will not speak of his own. He will speak only what he hears. And he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said that the spirit Spirit will re, you, uh, the Spirit will receive from me whatever He will make known to you. In other words, He'll receive things from me and He'll make it known to you. In other words, your life will not, your life will not be a life of darkness. Your life will not be a life of fear. Your life will not be a, a life of sadness. Your life will not be a life of grief. Your life will not be a life of regret. He said, this Holy Spirit is a gift to you so that you might know the fullness of God in your life. Let's just, 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 just look a little bit more, then we'll just kind of stop here. i stop in a few minutes. In, ver in Acts chapter 1, we find Jesus is about to ascend to his Father, and he's been through the cross, and he's risen again, and he's spending some time with the disciples and this is what he says in Acts chapter 1, verse 4. He says, Do not leave this town of Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father has promised you, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water. There you go again. But in a few days, You'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, here's the thing. Israel is occupied by the Romans. There's so much slavery, so much invasion in people's lives right now. They're very concerned that how long will they live like this? They're very concerned that somehow the Savior has come, and will he not somehow show them how to fight off this Roman Empire, to throw off the oppression that's on them, to throw off the regulations that they're finding on them, to throw off all this kind of political stuff that somehow has taken away their freedom. Funny thing is, Jesus is not talking to them about that. What's he talking to them about? He says, I need you guys to stay in this town. Because if you stay in this town, you're going to experience the thing, the person that needs to help you. And without him, you won't achieve what you need to achieve in this world. Acts chapter 2 and the upper room is not a freak accident. It's the intentional work of God, putting something into the church to help them live in the world in which they're going to live. He wasn't telling them of how to find their social life free. He was telling them of how to live their life free. Not rules were going to make them feel better, not laws that were going to make them better, but a law that Paul talks about, a law of spirit and life in them was going to make them better. Whoa! 
I says, so you have to wait for this Holy Spirit. I like how even Jesus, at the end of the day, is bringing them right back to Genesis chapter 1. To the point where the Holy Spirit was going to make something new. I think it was Jesus who says this. He says, out of your innermost being will flow rivers of fresh water, new water. And then it says at the end of that, and by this Jesus was meaning the Holy Spirit. Jesus was not slack on talking about the Holy Spirit. Jesus was not somehow forgetting about him, ignoring him. Jesus was putting him front and center on a constant basis. And even if we considered him the weird uncle, Jesus considered him a gift. A gift that every one of us needs. I want to say this to you very clearly. I don't think that I could be the spiritual dad, father, that God wants me to be without a life in the Holy Spirit. I don't think I can be the husband that Cindy wants to see, that God wants to see, without the Holy Spirit. Mind you, I've tried, but it always hasn't worked. I don't think I could be the friend that you would want me to be without the Holy Spirit. And I definitely could never be the neighbor that you want to see without the Holy Spirit. However, Christianity is trying very hard to do that. Meanwhile, Jesus, God, and the Holy Spirit realize that the church can only be shaped and formed out of its darkness into light with the Holy Spirit. They were convinced of these things. My question is, why aren't we? They were convinced of these things and believed that they could not move forward without this gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was central to families. The Holy Spirit was central to Monday, central to Tuesday, central to Wednesday. The Holy Spirit was central to every part of their day, every part of their schedules. He was a part of everything they were doing. Yet somehow, in Christian circles, we feel we can live without him. He is the one that somehow will produce Christ in us. Not only that, and I'm not trying to separate this from Jesus, but it says that the world would know that you are Christians by your love. Do you know what scripture I'm talking about? What is the fruit of the Spirit? Love. Joy. Isn't it interesting that love is mentioned first? If I am to love you, if I am to love my friends, if I am to love my neighbors, if I am to love people in this group of people, then I can't do it by myself. Why? Because I look at your faults first. I look at your weaknesses first. I look at it through my own insecurities. I look at it through my own fears. I look at it through my own sense of like I am, am uh, you know, comparing one to another. But guess what the Holy Spirit does? He just moves that all away. And he shows me how to love unconditionally. I'm asking you today to just look at this thing in Acts chapter 19 and verse 1, 2, 3, 4. 
And think of the question they're asking. And the question that they're asking is, do you know of this Holy Spirit? Have you received this Holy Spirit? And if our answer is no, the expectation that they're asking this is, you need him. You need him. Because life as a believer is static without him. We're missing the point of what it is to be shaped. We're missing the point of what it is to find ourselves being molded into the hand of God. We're missing what it is to somehow see all those things that somehow life has put on us removed and God replace it with his grace and his goodness. The Holy Spirit is that gift to us. And it's simply by understanding that there is more, more in him. And we open ourselves to that. We receive him. Let me just say this. I said that once to a person. The person said to me, oh, for myself, I'll get demons. And I said, well, I find it very strange that you would say that because I'm not opening myself to anything. I'm opening myself to God. I'm opening myself to God. That's who I'm opening myself to. I'm opening myself up to him and saying, Lord, I understand that I'm to be like you. And I'm not doing a good job. I've tried to make it all work. At times, I feel like a failure. Anybody with me? At times, I sit there and I beat myself up. At times, I don't feel that you're hearing me. And I'm tired of this situation. I want to live in the power of the resurrection. I want to live in the power of the Holy Spirit. I want to see these fears inside me exercised and replaced with a spirit that will shape me and mold me into the intentions that God has all has had for me since the beginning of time. If you've not heard of this Holy Spirit, I'm telling you today, if you've not heard of them and experienced them, I'm telling you today. And it's by you saying yes to that as by how you receive him. It's no different than the day that you were born again and you asked Jesus into your life. It's no different by faith than we say, Holy Spirit, just baptize me with your Holy Spirit. In the Bible, we see sometimes that people spoke in tongues. We see that some people prophesied. We see a lot of people praising God. And I think sometimes we have this dramatic expectation of what's going to happen. I think the Holy Spirit knows you better than any of us here and better than any other story that's out there. And he knows exactly who you are. And for me, boy, it's been a process. A process of going home, reminding myself of what happened in my life. And then one day in the midst of praying at 16 years old by my bed and saying, God, I want to follow you. All of a sudden the words stopped and tongues came out of me and flowed across my bed. And I wept knowing that somehow my words became heavenly. 
and they're reaching the heart of God. Hey, didn't happen in a meeting, but I know at that meeting I made a decision and that I would live a life with the Holy Spirit. Church needs it. The people of God need it. They need to know the Holy Spirit. If you're here today, you're saying, hmm, that's me. I'm tired of this whole rigmarole. I'm not telling you a fairy tale. I'm telling you the reality of what it is to actually know the Lord. Because I want to say this in closing. If you read in Acts chapter 8, it says that when you pray, it's the Holy Spirit who takes your prayer. <laughs> and he takes it to the throne of God. It says it's the Holy Spirit who then pleads your intentions before the Lord. You need to look at that out. Just see what that says. And I think, man, I've never seen prayer this way before in my life. And all of a sudden I'm praying in ways, believing now that my words are heard because the Holy Spirit's just picking them up, running them to the Father, and he's making my case before him. Isn't that great? Isn't that great? It's not a static life. It's a supernatural one. You say, just give me one moment here. I want to say to you, we cannot live this world with things that we see. We cannot live this world in the evidence of what we always see with our eyes. We believe in an unseen God who lives in an unseen world, who has an unseen Holy Spirit. Doesn't that make sense? It says in Hebrews 11, it says, if you want to believe in God, you must first of all believe that he exists, even though you do not see him. I believe in the supernatural. Why? Because I believe in an unseen God. I believe in a Holy Spirit I cannot see who inhabits my life, inhabits my day, invades the things around me, and walks with me every day. Whoa. My faith is not with what I see with my eyes or feel in my emotions. My faith is what the Lord has said, that if I ask, I shall receive. And I say that all to you today. Amen? Wow. So right now, let's just close our hearts off here to the Lord. I mean, to the, everything around us. And just open up to the Lord and just say, Father, I just want to commit this right now to you and Lord I know by your Holy Spirit and him being in this place here with us that you're talking to us Lord a lot of us live this life sometimes in this frustration of never just feeling enough good enough brave enough whole enough all these things Father we feel as if we fall short and even though we know you we're not a good enough to be a dad, good enough to be a husband, good enough to be a wife, good enough to be a child or a parent. Yet, Father, you've given us the Holy Spirit who's more than enough. Lord, I pray, break down our walls of resistance right now. Break down our doubts, break down our fears, break down those things that somehow we keep raising up that seem to matter more. I believe you want a church filled with the Holy Spirit. I believe you want my life to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I believe that this world needs a greater sense of your presence through the Holy Spirit. I believe you've given them to us as a gift to the church, to me as a believer, to me as a dad, to me as a husband. I believe you've given them to me. And because of that, I believe that, Lord. Lord, I, I just receive that into my life. 
I receive that into my life in whatever form and however you want to baptize me with your Holy Spirit. I receive that. And I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid of what God wants for me. I'm not afraid of the intentions that you have for me. I'm not afraid to walk in your purposes. I'm not afraid to be a living testimony of who you are. And because of that, I need your Holy Spirit. I need your Spirit. Now, if you're with me and you're praying this in your mind and in your heart and you've not heard or not spoken of this Holy Spirit into your own life, I'd be glad. Klaus would be glad. Joni would be glad. Jess would be glad. Tom would be glad. Kevin would be glad. Heather would be glad. Just put her hand on you. That's all we're going to do. Because that's what they did in the New Testament. So if, you, if you're looking that way, God's moving you that way right now. Just stick your hand up real quick. Okay, we got a few people here. Off. Can you help us? Heather, keep your hand up. Don't be ashamed of it. This is a, a great thing. This is a, the best thing. Be bold about it. Be bold about your choice. Be bold about what you're seeing here. Hmm. Anybody? Come on. If you need them. Hmm. So, Father, you see the people here, Father, that have their hands up. They're needing this. And, Lord, I'm not going to back off the word from, of experience. Because you said we're to experience your love so deep, so real, that it's unexplainable. That's what you say in your word. You say that in Ephesians. Now, Father, I'm asking that they will know and experience the Holy Spirit in the days to come in such great measures. Come, Holy Spirit, right now and touch their lives. We pray in Jesus' name. We pray, Father, that the old will go <laughs> and new days will come. New days of victory, new days of overcoming in life, new days of, Lord, fresh ideas, fresh thoughts, new things coming through, Father. We just pray in Jesus' name. Lord, I'm praying for a release of praise, a release of thanksgiving, a release of joy in Jesus' name. You say your joy is joy unspeakable and full of glory. Amen.